Hello, everyone, and welcome to another installment of City Lights Live. I'm your host, Peter Maravellis. You have reached the official online archive of City Lights sponsored events. On Monday, September the 18th, 2023, at 6 p.m. Pacific Time, City Lights had the distinct pleasure of hosting James Elroy, also known as the Demon Dog of American Letters. The New York Times has called him the neo noir eminence of LA crime fiction. Thus, here at City Lights, his writing is up there with some of the greatest literary fiction of all time. His gritty, unforgiving, down and dirty, uncensored, and fast paced novels have shook up readers to the core for decades. On this particular evening, we were thrilled to celebrate the publication of his novel, The Enchanters. James Elroy resurrects his character of Freddie Otash taking another plunge into the L.A. underworld in a tour de force of L.A.'s seedy underbelly. James Elroy is the author of Underworld USA Trilogy, which includes the books American Tabloid, The Cold 6000, and Blood's a Rover. He's also the author of the L.A. quartet novels The Black Dahlia, The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, and White Jazz. His books have been adapted to the screen, the staff here at City Lights had a delightful time that evening, the most fun we'd had in an event in a long, long time. We are happy to post the evidence here for your viewing pleasure. We hope you enjoy it as much as we did. I bring you now James Elroy at the top of his form. I put a spell on you. You ain't nobody's audience but mine. I know the history of City Lights books. I know all about the beatniks, even though I was too young to be one. However, for all of you in this room tonight, driving up here two days ago from LA, with friends, I compose a beatnik poem. It's dedicated to all of you. Dig it. Bring back the dead. Give them head. Remember the songs they sang and the words they said. From protracted adolescence to premature senescence, I do penance with regret for the epiphanies I never held and the joy I never met. Yeah. Good evening, peepers, prowlers, pederasts, pedants, panty sniffers, punks, and pimps. I'm James Elroy, the death dog with the hog log, the foul owl with the death growl, and the slick trick with the donkey dick. I am the author of 23 books, masterpieces all. They precede all my future masterpieces. These books will leave you Reamed, steamed, and dry cleaned, tied, dyed, swept to the side, screwed, blued, tattooed, and bafangood. These are books for the whole fucking family. If the name of your family is the Manson family. Yeah. And every one of you buy 1,000 copies of my new novel, The Enchanters, tonight. You will be able to have unlimited sex with each and every person on this earth that you desire every night for the rest of your lives. Yeah! If each and every one of you, by 2,000 copies, 
of my new novel, The Enchanters, you will be able to have unlimited sex with each and every person on this earth that you desire every night for the rest of your lives and still get into heaven as the result of a special dispensation signed by me, the Reverend Elroy. Yeah. If each and every one of you buy 3,000 copies of my new novel, The Enchanters, tonight you get the sex, you get into heaven. And for the first time in history, North Beach, San Francisco, will rule the world. You heard it here first. Off the record, on the QT, and very hush, hush. T.S. Eliot wrote, if you came this way, starting from anywhere, at any time and in any season, it would always be the same. You would have to put off sense and notion. You are not here to instruct yourself or to inform curiosity, or to carry a report. You are here to kneel where prayer has been proven valid. And for me, James Elroy, the demon dog of American literature, what better place to bow my head in prayer than in one of America's great bookstores where we all worship at the fount of the printed word on paper. Yeah. My novel, The Enchanters, is my best novel. I've said that about my prior 22 books, but I was wrong then, but now I'm correct. This book is a synthesis of everything I have learned in 44 years practicing the craft of fiction. And I've come to some conclusions. They build me up. They build one other man up. And they set the lineage for America's entire hard-boiled canon. The alpha and omega of the American hard-boiled canon are Dashiell Hammett and me. Hammett's first novel, Red Harvest, was published in 1929. My most recent novel, The Enchanters, is published in 2023. That is 96 years. The great jurist critic David T. Bazelon, who died before I was born and did not live to see me take over the Omega spot following Hammett, wrote this about Hammett. The core of Hammett's art is his vision of the masculine figure in American society. He is primarily a job holder. He goes at his job with a bloodthirsty determination, which proceeds from an unwillingness to go beyond it. This relationship to the job is perhaps typically American. The idea of doing or not doing a job competently has replaced the whole larger issue of good and evil. That's Hammett. That's me. We write about the displaced frontier American male 
in the turbulent 20th century. To paraphrase Ross McDonald, he is in the crossfire of the end of chivalry and the beginning of gangsterism. We are tortured. We are brutalized. We brutalize. We have tender sides. We are at our core bad men in love with strong women. And that is my soul theme. Tonight, I will read the first chapter of The Enchanters, after which I would welcome the most invasively over personal questions with three exclusions that each and every one of you peepers, prowlers, better ass pedants, panty sniffers, punks, and pimps has for me. <laughs> Chapter One, Los Angeles, eight twenty three PM, Saturday, eight four sixty two. The drop ran eighty feet. The cliff was loose dirt and no footholds. We hauled Shitbird up to the edge and showed him the view. The Pasadena Freeway southbound, due north of the Chavez Ravine exit and downtown LA. Steady traffic clocking through at 65 plus. Shitbird was Richard Douglas Danforth, white male American, approximate age 36. No green sheet, no wants, no warrants. He's a bleak cat with a pachuco haircut and a Sir Guy shirt. I held his right arm. Max Herman held his left arm. Red Stromwell jammed his head down and force fed him the view. Freddy O and the Hat Squad, we're at it again. Bill Parker says, jump. We say, how high? It's a kidnap job tonight. Harry Crowder and Eddie Benson watch dog suspect number two. They stood him up by their prowl sled. They fed him the threats, the car noise, the view. He's Morris Herschel Buzzy Stein, white male American, age 42. His perv sheet dates back to 1938. He's a stat rapo and a psycho snout diver. Danforth and Stein were bought and paid for. Kidnap was a gas chamber bounce. This gig was strictly rogue and ad lib. Here's the gist. A B-film actress named Gwen Perloff got strong arm snatched. It was late a.m. today. She lived in a cheese lux building up from the strip. Three men grabbed her on the sidewalk. They wore Fidel Castro masks. Multiple eyewits saw them. They shoved her into a double parked vehicle and jammed south. Said vehicle might have been a 58 Dodge or a 56 Chevy Nomad. Miss Perloff plays second leads in horror and dance craze flicks. 
She's a 20th century Fox contract slave. The strip is county turf. The L.A. sheriffs caught the squawk, but Fox kingpin Daryl Zanuck got tipped off. Some unknown woman called him. She think Danforth and Stein and spilled one of their two girl stash locations. Zanuck called his tight pal, Bill Parker. Chief Bill bootjacked a kidnap job. He dispatched Freddie and the hats to a house off of Sixth and Dunsmuir. We grabbed Danforth and Stein. Perloff was stashed elsewhere. Danforth and Stein refused to divulge the spot. Stein said there were three more snatch men out there. They pulled the job, not him and Richie. He zipped it then. Harry and Eddie whomped him with sap gloves. Stein still kept it zipped. Ditto Danforth. That mandated the death threat and the freeway drop show. I held Danforth's right arm. Max held his left arm. Red jammed his head down and force-fed him look -sees. Max went, where's the girl? Red went, give it up or you fly. Harry, Eddie, and Perv Dog Stein stood ten blocks back from the drop. It was August in L.A., hot and humid. Max and Red sweated through their shirts and their suit coats. Danforth wriggled and squirmed. He dug his feet in and thrashed. Dirt clods skittered off the cliff. The fucking drop loomed. I scoped Max and Red. They looked impatient. I clamped Danforth's arm. He buckled against me. My hand went numb. My legs fluttered. Max and Red ran 6'4 and 240. Their legs fluttered. Red said, you're wearing us thin, Richie. We can't keep this up all night. Tell us where the girl is so we can walk away from here. Danforth giggled and spit on red shoes. He said, I'm having fun. I slid on my brass knucks and kidney punched him. He stifled a screech and dug his feet in. I looked over the cliff. Car zigged by, fast, with no let up. Max sighed. Red sighed. Max said, sink him, Freddy. They dropped their hands. I shoved Danforth off the cliff. He treaded air for one split second. It's a put up job. Came out garbled. I heard him hit a car roof. I heard brakes squeal. I heard wheels thump over him. Crisscrossed headlights lit him up. A pimp mobile caddy dragged him against a guardrail and sheared off his feet. Ah.
I'd love to answer some questions. Three topics are verboten, politics. I don't talk about politics. Don't ask me my opinion on any hot pressing social issue. I'll cut you off at the knees. I don't talk about my personal life and I will not talk about movies that I have written for a paycheck or movies made from my books. Other than that, I'm listening. That's politics, too, too close to the bone for me. I'll, I'll tell you this, I love the cops. I love the cops, I'm on the side of the cops, absolutely unequivocally across the board there. No, 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 we're not having a dialogue. Lady, come on, we're not having a dialogue. Your, your status as a member of this audience means you ask a question, I answer the question. You don't challenge my responses. Okay, good. Think think up something else to say. Okay, sir. Okay, hey, tell tell your son this though. Okay, okay, we're gonna have a little bit of a dialogue here because I make up the rules as I go along. Uh, there's good for good, bad, or indifferent. There is a podcast that will be released on November sixteenth. The unexpurgated, unalloyed, unabridged American tabloid. I read all the narration and name actors read the dialogue. It'll be out on Audible. It's 21 and a half hours long. Holy shit. You're going to sit around and listen with those damn things stuck in your ear for that long? You can also, I've been told, play it through your computer or plug it into your stereo. Let your son know. There is a style I use that I do not deploy in the Enchanters that I used in Widespread Panic, my previous book, billed disingenuously as a novel. It's really three Freddy Otash novellas. It's scandal language. It's the language of disparagement. It is a riff off of the scandal language that Confidential, who Freddie worked for back in the 50s, used. And I've used it throughout my books for laughs. But the cadence derives from the fact that all of my books are minutely outlined so that I can live down, down to the most tiny, minuscule, submolecular detail. The outline for this book was 425 pages. That allows me to live in the language. That allows me to improvise as long as I do not diverge from the outlines, and that's where it comes from. I write third person subjective. You see it through one person's viewpoint, even though there may be three or four viewpoints. If it's four viewpoints, it's three men and one woman. If it's three viewpoints, it's one man. Even though I'm saying he said he did, you're in one human being's thoughts. This is a first person book that deploys an Elrovian cadence, but it's all from Freddie Otash's viewpoint. Sir. That's a good question. Even, the, you know, you know the answer, you put the answer in the question too. So that was pretty good. Yeah. yeah. The, the L.A. Quartet, okay, four novels that I wrote when I had hair. The Black Dahlia, The Big Nowhere, L.A. Confidential, and White Jazz. That is L.A., My Smogbound Fatherland between 1943 and 1958. The Underworld USA Trilogy, three big political books, American Tabloids, this man's son's favorite, The Cold 6000 and Bloods Are Over. They go from 58 to 70. Two, and 
I conceived of the second LA Quartet taking real life and fictional characters from the first two bodies of work and putting them in LA during World War II as much younger people. My first two novels of the quartet, the second quartet, Perfidia and This Storm, largely about the Japanese internment, 700 pages and 680 pages each novel. I got tired of LA during World War II and got the idea to write The Enchanters. And so I turned the quartet, the second quartet, into a quintet. And The Enchanters covers April to October of 1962. The two concluding volumes will fill out the rest of 1962. But the 362 set books all in some way refract events indigenous to World War II. So you get in the L.A. Quintet and the three concluding books, beginning with this one right here, a micro history of L.A. in 62. I might add that my histories are 75% deliberate distortion, to wit, I make this shit up, and 25% only verifiable fact. Good question. Pat yourself on the back, you know, like that. Yeah. Yeah, sir. I, I've, I've, I've owned a lot of Porsche Carrera 4s yeah, in my lifetime. Pardon me? I've never had a tire, but I like tires. I like I like tires. Uh-uh, uh-uh. But I have added so much in the way of options that they were valueless when I traded them in because nobody wants all the bells and whistles. No, no, uh-uh, uh-uh. I, I, no, I, li I like red and I like white. I like red and white, I like guardsman red, yeah, brother and all that shit. And I got to have a manual transmission. I got to, I got to have a clutch pedal, you know, if not, you're, you, if not, you're, you're suspect. Okay. All wheel drive, but it's gotta be a four. You need, you need a four everywhere because it's got the viscous coupling clutch and you can drive faster or longer and not kill yourself. Yeah, but but I'm hey hey lady, I'm hey, I I'm stretching the rules for this young man because he makes me feel masculine because he has even less hair than me. Yeah, if this young man here gave me a transplant, I wouldn't have to work as hard as I do, yeah, or be as abrasive with people, or or. I wouldn't have gotten in as many fights as I've gotten in my lifetime. Do you have any, anything more about Porsches? Yeah, okay. We, we, we can talk when you, when you sign your books. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But you know what the ultimate Porsche was to me, even though it had the ugly tea tree spoiler? You know, the 993 Carrera. No, it's the most beautiful one, but the spoiler was ugly as shit. Yeah. But I didn't have the bread to buy one back then. No, I don't because they're, yeah, yeah, yeah. They've gone way, 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 way up. My buddy uh, standing in the back, the man with the glasses. And, hey, who's the law in Santa Cruz? He's the DA in Santa Cruz. So yeah, yeah, right. yeah. So I, I've got I've got the palace guard here, and and they're all car guys, and they they all drive guardsman red cars appropriately okay next question getting out of carville usa okay hey ian well uh buzz meeks appears in my novels the big knower and la confidential 
Is he the hardest guy I ever killed off? Pardon me? No, no. Uh, no, he's just your favorite, Ian. Yeah, there's, there's actually a distinction. No, he's not. He's not. I'll, t I'll tell you in camera, in C2, uh, who the guy is. Yeah. Okay, fair enough. Okay. Yeah. Mark what, the shark? Yeah. Gail M. First woman I ever asked to marry me but I was 16 and she was 17 and I was drunk. And there's a biography. Whose biography is it called Dreams Die Hard? That's a good answer. You will. I mean, I'm, I'm not dying anytime soon. Yeah. No, but you know, I uh, you know, I I might need a free meal when the new book comes out three years from now, the sequel okay. to this. So all you got to do is show up here. Huh. Okay. I I don't think Philip Roth had a strong third act. Nah, nah, nah. I don't. I personally, I don't like Philip Roth. No, nah, I don't. I don't dig it. Pardon me? Yeah, yeah. Everybody says Philip Roth had a very strong third act. If, if you read the biography, the Blake Bailey biography, you, you won't like Roth either. And you won't like because of certain accusations hurled against Mr. Bailey, Mr. Bailey himself. Left in me yeah. before some horrible fucking malignant microbe invades me and you know worms his way into my brain and i start seeing people that aren't there and talking to my teddy bear from 1949 yeah i know how it is i've had this question before usually by a young fellow like you with lots of hair <laughs> but uh, and how many more books the two concluding Otash books and an enormous book set in LA on VJ Day, August 15th, 1945, and the entire 700 page novel in real time. I've written one other book. I'm sure Peter has copies here. In the paperback edition, my novel Perfidia has the month of Pearl Harbor in real time. Okay, more questions, sir. Don Crutchfield was a real life pal of mine. He was a private eye. He was a good guy, private eye, unlike Freddie Otash. He was a bad guy, private eye, and Crutchfield left us. We'll see him on the other side five years ago. Yeah, but I liked him very much. But he was he was pissed off over one thing. Why'd you give me brown eyes in the book? I'm the hero of the book. All the great gunfighters in the Wild West had blue eyes. I said, you know, dipshit, I gave him brown eyes because I had brown eyes. Uh, he's still pondering that on the other side. Anybody in this room beats me to the other side, you know, give my age, it's unlikely you, you tell Crutchfield. Give him my answer. Yeah. He's the hero of my book, Bloods Are Road. A dipshit kid becomes the voice of the American 1960s. Sir, again. Yeah, I just yeah, I decided to I was gonna write a Huey Long novel, but I was in the army briefly in Louisiana. Other than that, 
I know nothing about Louisiana and care less. I was going to write a Warren Harding novel, Washington, D.C. in the 20s. I decided not to. Yeah, it's not my bailiwick. Yeah. Nobody knows. We don't know. We don't know. But, you know, I wrote that book 40 years ago. It's a drag. Uh, don't bring me down. Because, yeah, you know, who killed the Black Dahlia or who killed JFK? It's a drag, baby. It's a drag. Sir, I'm, I'm teasing you. I have. I have. I thought of putting him in this book. He had just left the FBI to uh, become a prosecutor. You, you, of course, had a law degree. FBI agents in those days were all CPAs or ex-FBI men. He became prosecutor up in Dutchess County, New York. He was going to stay on the FBI, but he flunked the Washington, D.C. bar exam. And he's too broad a character. You'd know he was a psychopath. As soon as he, it's like throwing the world's biggest scenery chewer actor, the guy you just can't stand looking at on the screen. Like for me, it would be Robert De Niro. It's like putting him on screen. Oh, shit. Why am I here? G. Gordon Liddy in a book. Yeah. Yeah. Describes that in me. Yeah. No, 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 because I outlined down to the most minute level. I know everywhere it's going before I write the first word of the text. And you would think paradoxically, this allows me to live in the moment of the individual scenes as long as I don't divert their overall import in the book. So if any writer tells you, well, my characters talk to me, I thought it was gonna be this and it went off in this direction or not. No, they're being disingenuous at best, crazy at worst, because the characters don't exist. They were created by the author and in the end, what the person is talking about is the fact that they were presented with narrative options and the one that they took surprised them. You're welcome. Yes, sir. Yeah, yeah. My Dark Places is my memoir on my mother's 1958 murder. It's entirely factual, taken from police records. The two lead, of the two lead investigators, one man had died, John Lawton, and the other man, Ward Hallinan, was senescent. So I didn't have their memories to rely upon. I relied on records, except for the autobiographical ones. Nothing. We have nothing. No leads. We're never going to know. Yeah. It's like JFK and the Black Dahlia that way. Yes. No, brother. No, no, no. There's such a thing as negative research where I will read a book, like the book Got Us by Anthony Summers. Of, the the one comprehensive biography of Marilyn Monroe. I wanted to see how justified my intense dislike of Monroe was, and I read through most of this book and found it confirmed. The events surrounding her last months and her death are muddled. Nobody knows what happened. That means I have that much more latitude to fictionalize. 
about equal. About equal, and the outlines are harder to write than the text. And I will make some changes, not many, in the outlines as I go. Because preceding the outlines, I have spent months on a couch or crapped out on my bed thinking about the book and then taking notes and before I write the first word of the outline. So, man, these things are diagrammed. Ian. Last paragraph, last sentence, it comes to me partway through. Yeah. Yeah. I want to add uh, something, though, about the character Lowell Farr, who's a Pally High School senior in uh, 1963. So she'd be three years older than I am today. Uh, she was inspired by a girl I knew in junior high school and in high school. And there's a fabulous poem by Richard Hugo called Degrees of Gray in Phillipsburg. And the first several stanzas are famous. It's, a, it, it, it's really about male isolation, something I know about. And male isolation and alienation in general, it's the dominant theme of American literature in the preceding century. But this poem, up to a point, is mired in male self-pity. And my wife, the redoubtable Helen Kinode, sees me as largely being immune from that male self-pity because, frankly, I'm power-crazed and I don't have time for it. But... Hugo's poem dips out into it and then pulls itself out. And the poem begins auspiciously. You might come here Sunday on a whim. Say your life broke down. The last good kiss you had was years ago. James Cromley, not a writer I admire, used that line, the last good kiss for the title of one of his novels. And there is a great line during the self-pity part of the novel, wherein Hugo writes, and towering blondes, the world will not let you have. And that's Georgia Lowell Farr, because she's a tall blonde in this book here, The Enchanters, and I really like tall blondes. Right. So there you go. Or as Pauline Kale, the great critic, once said, sex is the great leveler and taste the great divider. Baldy, you got a good sense of humor. You're laughing at all the best lines. Yeah! Bald motherfucker. Okay. Not you in the back. You got a beard. Okay. When I had the idea for the second LA Quartet, I cherry-picked based on their ages and where they were supposed to be and whether or not they died off in World War II. I went through and checked my own work for the appropriate people. Yeah. No, no, I don't like it. I don't care. I only go there on book tours and to see friends, and then I'm out. When we got on the car and hit the five to come here to San Francisco, yeah, Saturday morning. Yeah. 
<laughs> I live in Denver, Colorado. Are you really? God bless you. Yeah. Nice town. You, you get to change the seasons. 200 above in the summer, 200 below in the winter. If I ever leave, yeah. My wife dumps me. If it happens, I doubt it. I'll move to Des Moines. I like Des Moines a lot. Nice town. Come on, two more questions. Brother. I'm a fanatical boxing fan. Beyond your wildest dreams. I, pardon me? Well, you know, there, there are three great boxers out and about today. So I'm going to go through them alphabetically. Terrence Bud Crawford, yeah. Nooye Inoue, and Alexander Uzik. Those, those are the three, three guys like that in one generation. Holy shit. I don't think Hagler was as great as Carlos Monzon, but yeah, I liked Hagler. Yeah. Yeah. The greatest fight I ever saw was the fight that made me a fight fan. I was 10 years old. It's December 1958. It was Montreal, light heavyweight title fight. Archie Moore, who was then 45 years old, and Yvonne Durel. See, so yeah, it's, on, it's on ESPN. Yeah, it's archived. Okay. Does anyone or does the group as an aggregate want to ask me the portentous question, why do you write? Why do you write? Right? Thank you, Roy. What? Anyone, come on. This, this, why do you write? Come on, yell it. In my craft or sullen art, exercised in the still night, when only the moon rages and the lovers lie abed with all their griefs in their arms, I labor by singing light, not for the strut and trade of charms upon the ivory stages, but for the common wages of their most secret heart. Not for the proud man apart do I write on these spindrift pages, but for the lovers, their arms round the griefs of the ages, who pay no praise or wages, nor heed my craft or art. Dylan Thomas. Thank you. God bless you. Mm.